and he will um, follow, he'll be followed by Carlton Hall, who will provide a two-part discussion on how you can begin to plan local strategies to address prescription opiate drug abuse in your community. And then uh, Amy Haskins will be the third presenter, who will go over some examples of how her coalition successfully addressed the opiate abuse problem in her county. And then finally, we'll take some time to answer your questions. So without further ado, I will turn it over to David. So good afternoon, everyone. I am David Wilson. And as Natalia said, I work for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, specifically in the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. And one of my main responsibilities in working at CSAP is I get the good fortune of being a part of our national public health observance called National Prevention Week. I am especially grateful for CATCA giving me 10 minutes or so to, to talk to you guys about National Prevention Week. Uh, there, are two, there are three things that I, I, I want to get across uh, in my 10 minutes. One, one is I want you to walk away after the webinar is over with a brief uh, description about uh, National Prevention Week. The second thing that I want to do is I want to let you know about some of the things that we are doing around prescription drug abuse and SAMHSA. And thirdly, if I've done my job correctly, I've inspired you to get involved with National Prevention Week. So I'm going to go through these really, really quickly. Um, but don't fret if I'm going too quickly, because I'm going to stick around, and hopefully you'll have questions for me at the end. Um, so National Prevention Week actually is coming up really, really soon, actually in 11 days. Uh, we celebrate this national observance uh, May the 17th through the 23rd. Uh, it is in our fourth year. And really what it is about or what the purpose of it is, is it's really dedicated to increasing public awareness of and around substance abuse and mental health issues, particularly one of the issues that we address during National Prevention Week is prescription drug abuse and uh, opioid prevention, uh, which is why I'm here today. I am hoping that some people on the call already know about National Prevention Week and are already planning some type of activity around National Prevention Week. Usually what we do around National Prevention Week is that we highlight a particular substance abuse or behavioral health issue every day. Um, and it just so happens that the daily themes for this year's National Prevention Week start off with the prevention of tobacco use. That's on the 18th of May. On the 19th, uh, the theme is the prevention of underage drinking and alcohol abuse. Uh, on the 20th is our theme day of prevention of opioid and prescription drug abuse. On the 21st, we tackle prevention of illicit drug use and youth marijuana use. Uh, on the 22nd is the prevention of suicide. And lastly, uh, because we are the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, we cannot avoid the promotion of mental health and wellness. Um, I know with 11 days that many of you who have not been familiar with National Prevention Week uh, wouldn't be able to plan an event, but I have a few things later on in my presentation that I can tell you to do right now. Um, but the name of this webinar is Crafting Effective Pre uh, Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Strategies. And for those of, who, of you who are going to be tackling that, and I know Carlton is going to be speaking about how you do that on, from a national perspective, and our last presenter is going to be telling you how she has done that as a coalition. I am hoping that if you follow and you develop and you implement your strategies and you 
demonstrate some impact of the strategies that you're going to implement, then you will be ready to promote and showcase those effective strategies next year for National Prevention Week, which is actually taking place May the 15th through the 21st, uh, 2016. So I'm going to stop there about talking about National Prevention Week, and I just wanted to make you some aware of uh, some things that we're doing on the federal level at, at SAMHSA. Um, for those of you who are coalitions and are always trying to involve yourself with SAMHSA and to be made aware of grant funding opportunities, I just wanted to remind those who may or may not know, SAMHSA has a, a grant called the Partnership for Success Program, and it is a grant program that is designed to address two key priority areas. One of them is underage drinking, and the second priority area of the Partnership for Success grants is prescription drug, uh, prescription drug misuse and, and abuse among persons 12 to 15. So for you coalitions who have a specific focus around prescription drug use, that is one of SAMHSA's main grants addressing prescription drug abuse. I also want to mention a brand new RSA that is hitting the street. It's called Targeted Capacity Expansion, Medication Assisted Treatment, Prescription Drug, and Opioid Addiction. It is an RFA that is coming out of one of SAMHSA's sister agencies, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, and it's an $11 million grant for, for three years, and it is in CSAT is going to be awarding up to 12 awards for that particular RFA. So I wanted to make you guys aware of that. I also wanted to mention three upcoming things that SAMHSA has on the books as it relates uh, to prescription drug abuse. And this is for FY 2016. One, we are talking about medication assistant treatment for prescription drug abuse and opioid addiction, and that's going to be an effort that may result in another RFA that we are collaborating with a AHRQ, which is a sister agency. The second thing is that we are trying to set aside $12 million for yet another RFA just addressing prevention opioid overdose related deaths. And that would be a grant program that would be out of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. And then lastly, uh, there is another RFA that would be coming out of my, my center, which is the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, and it would be a, a strategic prevention framework uh, grant for prescription drugs, and that would be a $10 million RFA. So all three of those uh, RFAs that I just mentioned are, are in the works and are to be expected to be rolled out in 2016. So I want to come back to National Prevention Week. I want to list just a few events or activities that most uh, communities and, and coalitions do as they're raising awareness around National Prevention Week. Uh, health fairs is a very popular event that happens during National Prevention Week. There's uh, prevention themed art contest. There are um, there are school assemblies and lunchtime talks. People do workshops and trainings. Many of our communities and coalitions hold town hall meetings on a variety of those themes that I mentioned before. And then some people get awfully creative and do things outside of the box, like five mile caves and and some do theater performances with young people. Um, whatever it is 
that is going to demonstrate the impact of an issue that you do already in your community are the types of things that we would want you to do for National Prevention Week. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about where you could get tools and resources and materials to help you to, to do your event. Uh, as you can see on the screen, the link for our webpage is www.samsa.gov backslash prevention week. Uh, that web page is in English and in Spanish. Uh, it has the biggest things that you need in implementing your event, which is our toolkit. It has all of the promotional materials that you can download. It also has our promotional video, which can be adapted for local events. And I believe um, that we are going to put the, the web link to the video in the chat box so that you guys can actually watch that. Um, there is the prevention pledge um, that many communities use as an activity. And of course, there is the I Choose project, since it seems like all of the world is doing some kind of selfie. Uh, we, we like to uh, uh, throw our hat into the ring and ask people to do healthy selfies. And that probably best describes the iTunes project. Um, lastly, for those of you who want to do something uh, leading up to National Prevention Week but haven't had the time to plan an event, uh, there is going to be a national press event that is happening on May the 18th. It is happening at the National Press Club. Uh, from 10 to 11.15 a.m., uh, the live web link is going to be on the website that I just gave you a couple of slides ago. And one of the neat things that we are doing as a part of that uh, kickoff event, event is we're going to be releasing some brand new SAMHSA materials. And one of those materials happens to have a prescription drug abuse focus. It's, uh, uh, I wanted to throw that out as a teaser. But one of the things that we're also asking people to do is if you participate in the Choose Prevention digital activity, which is either taking some sort of picture demonstrating what prevention looks like to you or to your community, and if you send that in to us using hashtag Choose Prevention, then our, our guest speaker during that one hour press event is going to be live uh, showing all of the prevention, uh, choose prevention photos that have been coming in over the last month or so. So it's an opportunity for you to um, showcase yourself and your selfie to a national audience around uh, prevention. So I am going to shut up there, uh, <laughs> and I know you guys will have an opportunity to ask questions, uh, so write them down, because I, I think I don't come back until the very, very end. So please have many questions for me about National Prevention Week or of any of the grant opportunities that we are doing around prescription drug abuse in SAMHSA and the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. Now we're going to turn it over to Carlton Hall for his portion. Terrific. Terrific. Well, I'd also like to add my thanks uh, to David uh, and to uh, SAMHSA for the important work that you all are doing uh, to support our coalitions uh, throughout uh, the nation. Thank you so very, very much. Also, thank you to Amy um, and the leadership that you're providing. Uh, 
right. Thank you, Amy, for the leadership that you, you're providing in your local community and coalition, uh, as well as to my colleagues here at CADCA, Natalia, and our terrific communications team led uh, by Mary Elliott. Thank you also very much for coordinating all of this. I actually believe I have the, um, the easiest portion of the day and, and grateful for that. See, I simply get to share some approaches and concepts and tools uh, that we've utilized here to encourage coalitions uh, to use when they're facing this important issue. Uh, while Amy will be coming on and having what I believe is the more exciting and more significant task uh, to uh, share with you how she and her coalition has translated uh, the theoretical into some practical, pragmatic progress on behalf of their communities. Here is what we will attempt to accomplish with the brief time that we have uh, today. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to share a bit about how we would develop what we refer to as a framework for change. Uh, we are going to speak about a logic model. It would not be CAC if we did not talk about a logic model as a way of addressing the serious issue around RS and over-the-counter uh, drug abuse. Um, how do we utilize that to be able to identify comprehensive strategies and what are the elements that are important for us to note in that? Um, and what's the difference between environmental strategies and how those environmental strategies will be able to help us to achieve um, community level change? As I mentioned before, uh, we're going to learn from real life applications of these concepts and tools and hopefully provide you with an opportunity to learn about some resources that will help you in that regard. So I'd like to start this conversation off uh, by uh, asking a question just nationally, how do we choose to respond to the problem that's associated with this? The problem of lost productivity or increasing criminal justice costs. Uh, Skittles parties, uh, and for those of you who may not uh, know what Skittles parties are, Skittles parties where young people have been found to take um, any kind of variety of, 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 of prescription or, or over-the-counter medications uh, and wash them down with alcohol showing up in our emergency uh, uh, departments and hospitals, uh, leaving them with uh, a lot of confusion about how to address those young people. Um, or those individuals that are simply trying to manage pain, but yet they become addicted as a result of that. Well, in 2011, um, the Office of National Drug Control Policy put out a federal response establishing the roles of federal agencies, setting prevention goals and best practices and making recommendations and suggestions about guidelines um, um, regarding best practices that focused on four areas uh, to reduce um, uh, Rx abuse, uh, education, monitoring, um, proper disposal and enforcement, yet the problem that we are looking at kind of on a national level is, is actually varied and complex. Uh, I, I ask you to consider uh, a few things. First and foremost, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, Prescription drug abuse is on the rise and accounts for more than a third of all drug abuse in the United States. Secondly, uh, it's widespread and affects all types of communities regardless of the size and the region, the geographic region you happen to be in. Thirdly, there is a variety of drugs that are most commonly abused, from opioids like Oxycontin and Percocet and Vicodin, uh, to um, central nervous system depressants such as Xanax. Um, we were just having a conversation about that here. Uh, and stimulants uh, such as amphetamine. Um, there's also a variety of factors that are external uh, such as the lack of, of stringent enforcement practices or the easy access uh, via the internet. Um, and even just simply the lack of awareness um, that is found in many of our communities related to this. Um, the variety of those that are impacted um, are also a consideration. Older adults to adolescents, 
women and health practitioners are among those that are most uh, impacted by this. So this is a varied and complex issue nationally. The greater the complexity of the community problem, the greater the need there is for utilizing a community problem solving framework like the strategic prevention framework. What I'd like to say is before a community can do anything about solving the problem, it must first understand and demonstrate that it understands the context with which in which that problem is occurring. Logic models help us to do just that. The benefit of a logic model and making sure that we're utilizing a logic model is that it helps us to align those interventions that we are looking at uh, and, and thinking about with our intended outcomes. It makes clear what our priorities are and how we might be able to best allocate those resources to be able to get the best result for the least amount of money. Um, it also helps us to tell our story in a way that shares with others how we've been able to impact uh, that issue and that challenge. Simply put, a logic model is a visual representation of our understanding of the problem and its context and settings and how we might intend to address that problem in a way that honors the community by fully engaging the community in this process. And regardless of what the format, design, or shape of your logic model, um, if it is going to be effective, it really requires that it, it should contain five components. Uh, we'll briefly go over each of these components as I go through uh, this presentation. But more importantly, just want to share with you that a logic model provides a pragmatic way of, of exploring and employing the creative intellect of our communities by engaging them to describe the relationship between the host, the agent, the physical and social environment. In our case, we, when we're dealing with um, Rx uh, abuse, the agent can be defined as the prescription or the over-the-counter drug or the prescription itself that was needed to get that drug. Clearly defining the problem is where we would start. Interestingly, prescription and over-the-counter drug abuse is a tripart problem uh, with, that requires different responses. Uh, from those that are dealing um, with therapy and in therapy that are in danger of becoming addicted to abusable med medications versus recreational use versus those that are addicted um, as we encounter them. We must clearly state the problem, and if we uh, clearly state the problem, then it needs to be able to meet these criteria. Addressing one problem at a time, making sure that we have data to support that and that it focuses in on our strategies. Many of you are aware of our um, community problem solving process, which we refer to as a root cause problem analysis process, where we start off by asking why is this problem occurring in, this commu in, in our community. If you're going to do that, you need to follow certain criteria. We need to make sure that as we're asking these questions, we are following what we know and what we understand in prevention science. Is there a, is there a scientific, a research-based relationship between that root cause and the problem that we're addressing? Does it meet with the data that we've collected on our community? And does it um, um, meet the expectations and the experience of our community members? Here's where we get to dig a little bit deeper, though, um, because not all root causes or risk factors are equal or created equal. There are, in fact, some root causes or risk factors that we can address related to RX abuse that would yield or have the potential of yielding greater population level changes and outcomes. If we were to utilize what I refer to as a question-driven approach. I, I love this quote by Tom, Thomas Watson. The ability to ask the right question is more than half the battle to finding the answer. 
If we're going to dig deeper for each of those, we want to ask specific and appropriate questions, such as in social access. Are you getting uh, the Rx drugs or over-the-counter drugs um, from medicine cabinets or from their friends? Retail access. What are um, Rx prescriptions? Uh, what are the Rx prescriptions or sales practices in our community? Is doctor shopping going on? If we're looking at price and promotion, what advertisements are youth exposed to in our community and social media? When youth obtain uh, Rx uh, or prescription drugs uh, via insurance, what are the co-pays? Who pays that? What are the costs of the legally sold prescription drugs in our community? As we're dealing with laws and enforcement, what laws are in place that restrict youth abuse of prescription drugs or over-the-counter drug abuse? Are they enforced? If so, how? And what are the community norms associated with prescription and over-the-counter drugs uh, as it relates to community events that are being sponsored within our community? These are questions that we would look to to help us to delve even more deeply to get a better understanding of the issue and challenge in our community, which brings us to the last element of that logic model, which are the lift conditions, which is where the rubber actually meets the road. And what we want to say about that local condition is that the local conditions need to meet three criteria. Is it specific, meaning can it concretely describe the context and the setting of that root cause that we've identified and prioritized? Is it identifiable? Can you take someone physically and show them what you're talking about? And lastly, can you actually do anything about it? Is it actionable? If it meets those criteria, what we want to share is that for every element of our logic model, we need to make sure that we gather, prioritize, and display the data that actually describe the patterns of use um, of the host and the agent's interactions with each other. Who is the host? When, where, and how does this issue occur? Who or what are encouraging the interactions between the host and the agent? This would generally involve qualitative or quantitative data practices. So if we're going to be successful at doing this, everything starts with the logic model, which is kind of my first message to everyone. And if we're going to do that, we need to understand that crystallizing stronger conditions have to be able to meet those three criteria that I've identified. Make sure that those strategies are aligned to those local conditions and make sure that we're able to utilize multiple strategies that will merge into a cohesive plan. We're going to talk more about that after um, I ask uh, a question of you all and then bring in Amy for her input. And so the question that I actually have for you all, and I'm going to ask my colleague Melanie if she might be able to help us with this, but has your coalition developed a logic model with strong local conditions as a foundation for your plan to prevent prescription or over-the-counter drug abuse? Yes or no? Amy, could you help us? So just as a reminder for all of you participants today, um, good, I see that, that a lot of you are answering the question, but right underneath is the participant panel with your name. Um, the last icon has a check mark. You can respond with yes or no. So I'm going to let this generate for a few more seconds. Looks like I'm getting some nice responses. Fantastic. Well, as they are responding, Amy, I'm going to ask you and turn this over to you. Um, what thoughts do you have about this? Because you actually did this work in, in Jackson County. So can you tell us a little bit about what some of your thoughts and your ideas are here? Sure. Um, Probably one of the most important things that I can say is with your logic model, you have to make sure that you can gather data to support your root cause and your local conditions. Um, with our particular county, we, we could tap into our pride surveys that, that our school system had done, but with our state surveys that were available, we would always get lumped in with smaller, other small communities. And so we really had to look at some of the data points that we could find that would be out of the box. 
Um, so that's when we started looking at the number of runs that our ambulance does for overdoses, for overdose calls, the number of police reports for drug arrests, um, the number of private vehicle transports that go into our ER for overdoses. Um, we contacted the Office of Vital Statistics and asked for you know, the causes of death as they were stated on the death certificates. We looked at um, our Board of Education's random drug testing and what results they were receiving from that. And then, of course, our most prized information came from our, from our youth focus groups. We would do those and we would ask the kids specifically, where are, you, where are your peers getting this from? And we didn't have them talk out loud. We would give them postcards or um, index cards. And we would ask them to fill out an index card and tell us, all of the drugs that they know that families and family or friends are using, and then on the back side, tell us all of the places that they're accessing those drugs from. And that's how we really got a lot of our information that provided us the ability to know what we were dealing with here in our community. Thank you, Amy. Um, and Amy and Jackson County are just a perfect example, a great example of why your coalitions are in perfect position to address prescription and over-the-counter medicine abuse. Uh, because of your ability to bring all of those required players uh, to uh, the table. I, I see here from our results, uh, from, our, from our poll, uh, that there are a number of you that have yet to consider um, um, creating a logic model. If you have a need and require any kind of assistance with doing that, please make sure you contact us here at CAC and we'll be glad to help you out uh, with respect to that. Uh, but as we shared before, the logic model um, is really kind of where uh, this all begins. See, once you've asked and answered the questions, but why and but why here, the next question is usually now what? Um, as I've shared earlier, everything begins with a credible, uh, clearly understandable logic model with strong local conditions. But what we want to consider as we're looking at creating comprehensive strategies is that the higher the level of specificity um, that you have, that you bring to your understanding about the issue, uh, about the problem, the higher the level of specificity you will bring to your prevention strategies. Um, and so we want our, our strategies to meet the three ideas that you see there on the screen. One, we want to make sure that we are comprehensive. There is a lot of information out there about a lot of different things folks are doing. Our point is that you don't want to do a take-back program or a drop-off program simply because the neighbor down the road is doing that. It needs to be considered as a part of a comprehensive set of strategies that you're bringing forth that's guided by the thinking in your community. And that comprehensive set of strategies needs to be mutually reinforcing. And we're going to share that point over and over. And sometimes utilize to augment what you already are doing uh, very well there in your community. So, at Kafka, we um, um, promote the idea and the notion that there are seven um, key strategies uh, that will help to bring about and promote population level or community level change. Each of these you might want to consider as a category of strategies that you can um, um, implement if you are looking to address uh, the prescription abuse or over-the-counter abuse problems in your community. But like we were sharing um, in the earlier portion around the root causes and risk factors, not all strategies are created equal either. As we are looking at how, uh, how we might address this, there are some strategies that will yield or have potential of yielding greater results um, um, in terms of affecting the entire population. We refer to those as environmental strategies. So the latter four strategies, categories of strategies that you see there on the screen, 
changing barriers in access, consequences, in incentives, looking at the physical design of your, of your community and how we might be able to address that, looking at changes in policies and practices and rules. Those all represent environmental strategies that will have the impact of affecting everyone in your population. I think of it like a thermometer, uh, like a thermostat uh, in a freezing room. I can either buy a coat for everyone in the room or I can look for the thermostat in the room and adjust that for everyone in the room. Those strategies are like finding the equivalent of finding the thermostat in our community as it relates to um, addressing prescription abuse. Uh, prescription drug abuse and over-the-counter abuse. So how does this look in the real world? Well, if I can take one example here uh, by one community, all of this is guided by the work of, of, of the community and really demonstrating that they understand the context and the setting in which the problem is taking place. And so the important idea here is to find what's the appropriate combination of strategies. In other words, what's the proper dosage that we're going to need to be able to affect change? This is no one-size-fits-all approach. These choices are determined by your understanding of the problem, the root causes, and the local conditions. As you can see here uh, in this example, uh, they've identified uh, the root cause of availability and they've determined that uh, these young people are stealing it from medicine cabinets, providing information. You want to ask for each one of these, who requires this and what is it that they require? In other words, if they're providing information, who needs the information and what information do they need? If they're training or building skills, who requires the skills and what skills do they need? Who requires the support and what support do they need? Here we're talking about training staff um, at, uh, in these schools on, uh, uh, training staff in these schools around the proper RX um, uh, prescription disposal techniques. We're talking about providing support uh, to medical uh, doctors and dentists and pharmacies. Uh, enhancing access um, by making it uh, uh, impossible for folks to think that we are creating a barrier for them for, for their drop-offs. Um, creating incentives for them to, to participate in uh, this take-back program. Looking at the physical design of our community to ensure that uh, there is a way for folks to participate fully and engage uh, in, this, in this program. And then looking at policies that would be better enhance what we're able to do here. What I'm trying to demonstrate with this example is that these seven strategies are not independent of each other, but rather they work in a reinforcing way to ensure that we're able to actually really address that local condition. And so we invite you to actually come to a, and, and visit uh, our prescription toolkit uh, that's located on our website. Uh, and within, within, each of, 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 within each of these strategies, there are specific um, strategies and programs that are highlighted, and I will very, very briefly go over a few. So if we're talking about providing information here, you know, we're looking at um, educating others. And you can see here uh, that some communities have assembled a core group of community leaders to help think about what kind of messages are necessary and required. Placing messages uh, in locations that are frequented by those that are most impacted or most usually impacted by the issues, such as young people or seniors, uh, that uh, how do we get the messages out to them. Enhancing skills, creating a uh, curriculum, looking at our school curricula and identifying where we might be able to enhance that curricula by creating a module that can be inserted into an existing curriculum. 
How do we build the skills of unlikely sectors in our community? Uh, one community uh, did a really, really great job of working with realtors who would go into homes as they are showcasing homes, educating the owners of the properties about locking up uh, their medicine cabinets uh, and, and the like. Providing support by looking at creating and establishing relationships with treatment programs in our communities uh, and being able to enhance uh, the capacity that we are working with in, within our communities. Um, looking at uh, how we might be able to provide recognition uh, to businesses in other locations, um, how we might be able to work with law enforcement and other partners to enhance uh, the access to the, to the strategies that we're trying to implement. I'm sorry I got a little bit of ahead, ahead of myself there. As we're relating, as we're speaking about changing incentives and creating um, some incentives for participation, here's where we talk about recruiting those that might be able uh, to uh, be a part of this process uh, by uh, making sure that we're able to provide appropriate recognition for those partners. Looking at signage and where we might be able to create, uh, create uh, and place these messages in key locations as an example of changing the physical design uh, and changing and modifying um, um, certain policies uh, that would uh, help us to enforce uh, those rules, those laws that are in place um, and make it uh, um, uh, better and stronger uh, for our communities to actually uh, be able to impact change in their communities. So these strategies uh, and this list of strategies are, uh, you'll be able to get more information on if you visit our toolkit. If it sounds like a lot, it is a lot. Uh, but what we want to share with you is that the most important thing is that we're trying to encourage our coalitions to think comprehensively, even if you don't have the ability at this point in time to act comprehensively. We have to start thinking through this issue and telling the truth about what's going to be required in order to create and affect change. Some of the typical challenges that come up are that local conditions are not specific enough uh, in our community, uh, that our local conditions um, are focused on attitudes rather than behaviors that we're trying to change, uh, that there's no clear policy initiative that's related to the local condition that we're trying to affect, uh, and that communities may not agree with our priorities or the resources aren't available. So that is kind of the 30,000 foot view on how a coalition would begin to address this. But again, as I mentioned, what's more exciting to me is to hear from Amy who can share with us how she actually utilized this process uh, with her coalition and brought these concepts to bear uh, to be able to create some really important changes in her community. So with that, Amy, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, first, for the opportunity to share with everyone today. Um, in Jackson County, we have certainly had our um, barriers that we have had to face, but we have um, overcome those with great strides, I think. Let's see if I can get the slides to work. There we go. Just some quick facts for you all and to give you a little background. Um, Jackson County is a very rural Appalachian community bordering the state of Ohio, and we have about 29,000 residents. And as you can see, we are at almost 18% of our residents here in our county are over the age of 65, um, and that is higher than the, national, than the state average. And then 25% of our kids live in poverty with the per capita income at almost $22,000. And our coalition um, came about in 2005, really, behind closed doors. Um, our city officials did not want anyone to know that we had a problem, but they wanted to discuss the problem that they thought might be approaching us. After the death of a 21-year-old um, in a gas station bathroom, he was found with a needle in his arm from shooting up heroin. And so in 2006, um, we experienced the start of a rash of deaths for the next two years. Between the ages of 15 and 26, our youth were dying, and we could not figure out why, and the community started to get 
outraged and began to ask what was going on. So from there, our coalition was really born. And what we ended up looking at was you can see in, in 2005, going back to 2005, our OxyContin use among our 12th graders was double the national rate. And in 2007, you can see that we dipped to 2.8%. And that is because our youth went from OxyContin to using fentanyl patches and methadone. And then you can see that our OxyContin rates increased again at 7.1 percent by 2009. Now the scary part of all this that you don't see is when, when we started um, looking at our pride survey results that our school system does, they survey grades 6 through 12 every grade every two years. With the particular kids that passed away, almost all of them were in the same graduating senior class. And we have two high schools in this county. So um, they weren't all from one particular high school, but they were all within the same graduating class. And no one had ever taken the time to look at those statistics from Pride Survey to see really what the data was telling us. So we took the opportunity to do that. Now, with me working for our local health department, I have access to a little bit more statistics and epidemiologists that some other people may not have access to. So we contacted our Office of Vital Statistics. And I wanted to know from 2006 to 2008 what the top four drugs in the body at the time of death were for those 16 youth that we lost. And so this is what that information came back with. We were looking at methadone, fentanyl, hydrocodone, and diazepam. And not every kid had every single one of those in their body, but there was a pretty good mixture of one, if not more, of those four in each of those 16 young people that we lost. So in 2009, we wrote for the very first time for the Drug-Free Communities Grant. And in September of 2009, we were funded. And so um, I, I'm going to guess that most of you all know what the 12 sectors are, but in case you don't, there's a list there. And that is actually a picture of um, a lot of our youth. We took 14 kids to Nashville at mid-year one year. We have very large youth coalitions here. And with going through CADCA Academy in 2010, we were able to really focus in on our logic model and try to truly identify what the problems were. Um, we worked on this as a coalition, and it was very hard for our coalition members to go away from um, one-time events and, um, you know, if you just give them the information, they'll, they'll know what to do, they'll take it, and they'll run with it. And really trying to figure out and prove why each of these local conditions and these root causes was part of our problem. It had to be actionable, just like Carlton mentioned. And it was very difficult for some of our members to, to understand that and really think about um, what it truly was the reason for our issues here in Jackson County. So we're going to start with strategy number one, which was providing information. And from parades to public service announcements um, and a media campaign, we increased we engrossed our community in letting them know that our coalition was here and we wanted to make a difference. So for the adults and parents and grandparents, we specifically highlighted the number of youth who were using and how they were accessing those drugs. So an example of one of the things that we did is up in your right-hand corner, you'll see the United We Stand drug-free Jackson County. We had an anonymous tip line. Nobody in our community knew that. So we made these window clings and provided them to every school. We have 14 schools. For every door it has one, every business that wanted one. We wanted to make sure that people had access to that anonymous tip line. And so for our parents and grandparents and adults that we were talking to, we wanted them to know this is an alarming number of youth that are using drugs in our community. But when we were talking to our kids, we wanted to make sure that we were using a positive norms campaign and saying, you know what, they may say that they're using, but really, this is, this is it. You know, 70% of you are not using. So 
So um, we made sure that we talked positively all the time to the kids, and we embraced the Above the Influence campaign. And what you see at the bottom of this slide is um, the Red Devil and the Viking. Those are both our high school mas mascots. And we encompass the Above the Influence symbol on their school signs. So we provided each of our high schools and our middle schools with signs with their mascot on it, probably eight to ten signs per school. And those are hung throughout the schools to remind the kids that you can be above the influence and choose to make positive decisions. We wanted positive peer pressure to rule out in our schools. We wanted positive peer pressure to overtake the negative things that were happening, happening within our school system. Some of the um, enhanced skills that we, in order to enhance skills, we talked to any classroom who would allow us to come in and talk to kids and share the information about um, prescription drug abuse and how dangerous it was. We trained businesses and our local teachers on how to recognize if someone was abusing substances and what that may look like because the reports that we were getting from the students at our schools, was, they were saying that kids were snorting up in the middle of classrooms in the cracks of their books and the teachers had no clue. So we wanted the teachers to understand what, if somebody's high, what does that look like? What is the behavior that they might um, present with? We partnered with a university that's about 40 minutes away, their pharmacy program, and utilized their pharmacy, pro their pharmacy students to provide a Lock It Up campaign to our seniors. And we also discussed with the seniors how do you dispose of your medication properly? And then, of course, the seniors wanted to talk to the pharmacy student about any interactions or something that they may be having with um, their medication, so that was a good resource for them. And we also partnered with a DEA diversion training instructor so that we could train local law enforcement, not just in our county but throughout our region, on identifying pills because they didn't go to pharmacy school, so they don't have a clue what they're looking at if it's not in the bottle and it's labeled correctly. We also had that individual train our law enforcement on the different diversion tactics that people use. Um, in addition, we had them trained on how to properly use the West Virginia Prescription Drug Monitoring Database because they weren't even quite sure how to do that. We had one in place, but if nobody knows how to use it, it's pretty useless. Again, community presentations for who anybody for anybody who asked us, we never passed up an opportunity. And then we talked a lot about proper disposal. You know, being in a rural community, we cannot um, say that it's okay to flush your medication down the down your toilets because most of our community is on septic systems and has well water. So that's a whole other issue that people don't think about when um, you're talking about prescription drug disposal. We were able to get out information on the West Virginia Prescription Quit Line. We have a 1-800 number that people can call 24 hours a day for counseling if they want to quit using or they need um, counseling for whatever reason. Um, mobilizing resources within your own community to address your local conditions, that's probably one of the, the biggest things that you can do. We've mobilized the resources within our community upwards to the amount of at least $75,000 to $100,000 if not more. Um, we helped with the development of disposal protocols, not only for our own local law enforcement, but for other law enforcement across the state. And we, of course, advocated and encouraged local physicians to use the, the pharmacy monitoring database. That was very important because we had physicians who did not understand how to do it or what the purpose was because they were so, so afraid of having it be a HIPAA violation to look up whether or not somebody was getting a narcotic from another physician. Some of our biggest wins in our community um, was that we did implement permanent drop boxes. We have two in our county, um, and we, on average, take out about 99 pounds per quarter out of those drop boxes. We have advocated at a state level for a number of years for our local law enforcement to have access to the West Virginia Prescription Drug Monitoring Database. Um, unless, here in West Virginia, unless you are on a drug task force, you do not have access to that database. So if they do a routine traffic stop and they need to look somebody up, they have to call somebody on the task force to have them look it up in order to have 
any information on this individual and whether or not it's a prescribed medication in their name. We also advocated on a state level to have access to other states' monitoring systems. Being a border county, it was very important that we have access to Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, Pennsylvania, because we were seeing trafficking, much like what, what many communities see with um, meth, we were seeing the smurfing where they would go and buy somewhere else and then bring it through. Um, and then we did regular disposal days. We did not wait for the DEA to do disposal days. We actually offer one every quarter and in addition to our permanent drop boxes and we take in about 99 pounds in an actual drop off, which is a lot of medication for a county of 29,000 people. We did try to change consequences. Um, our school system has a random drug testing policy. And for all middle and high schools, anyone who participates in school sports, choir, any school sponsored activity. And what we wanted to do, I told you earlier, that we tried to have um, positive peer pressure went out over the, over the negative happenings within the school system. And so we tried to incentivize the random drug testing policy that we have by giving out these drawstring bags that our youth coalition members designed and wanted us to order. And unfortunately for us, that particular strategy did not work in our county. Um, one parent whose child received the bag felt like we were um, pointing out the kids who didn't pass, even though no one knows who was drug tested each week unless the kids go out of the room and say they were drug tested. So we're still looking for ideas on how to do that. Another one of our largest wins was um, we were the first coalition and sheriff's department in the state of West Virginia to purchase an incinerator for the disposal and destruction of our medication that we collect every quarter. And um, this particular incinerator, we raised the money for it in about three weeks. It is owned by our sheriff's department. And um, you know, we had, we had to come up with policies and procedures and uh, basically the how-to because we were the first ones. We didn't have anyone to follow. We developed and implemented um, policy for static and point-in-time takebacks. We worked closely with, with the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection to not only do that for our county, but also make it kind of a best practices for all counties throughout the state of West Virginia. Um, and of course, we, we did even work with policy change. We worked to try to expand the random drug testing policy and, and won approval for that so that it would include some opiate testing um, and alcohol testing on specific uh, on specific random drug testing weeks. So let's say we recently just had prom. On that Monday following prom, included in their random drug testing, they may pay for alcohol to be included in that test. Or if we have um, any reports that opiate use among our students is starting to increase, then they may pay the additional money to have um, some additional opiate testing done. We work really, really hard in our coalition to build partnerships with unconventional partners. So I told you earlier that I do work here for the local um, health department. And for a lot of coalitions, I'm hearing that that is an unconventional partner. It's very important that you go into them. This is a public health crisis for many of us in our communities. And it's important that they be involved. They are your public health people. Um, they have access to some data and may be able to help you implement some of your strategies on a larger level. Um, again, the State Department of Environmental Protection, U.S. District Attorney's Office, we've worked with them, your hospital emergency rooms, ambulance services, your senior centers, and take advantage of some of those pharmacy students that may be working in your community because they have to have volunteer hours. Um, you can also see here the um, national rate, this was in 2012-2013, and the national pride survey rate for 30-day prescription drug use was 7%, Jackson County's was 6.5.
and the annual use is 14.8 and ours is 9.2 and that is due to a lot of the work that we have done over the last five years here in Jackson County. Again here, you can see in 2010 our monthly prescription drug use was 7.9. We were above the national average and since that time frame we've been able to say that we've stayed below the national average on monthly prescription drug use with our 12th graders. One of the most important things that I can say is increasing that perception of harm among your teens is integral. Um, you can see that for us and our teenagers, the largest percentage of perception of harm is among prescription drugs, and I think that speaks volumes for what we have done over the last five years. So much so that alcohol and marijuana have taken a dip, and that's what we are having to face right now is trying to get that perception of harm back up. But as we increase that perception of harm, you can see here the green bars are the number of um, things, activities, and, and things that we have done to market the safety of prescription drugs and how you can't share because we have a big sharing culture here in West Virginia. The red line is how many overdoses we've tracked over the last years. Um, you can see that we've had a major decrease in the number of overdoses in 2012. And I do have to say that West Virginia is not a state. We just now, this legislative session, passed um, a state law to have Narcan. So none of those overdoses and the decrease in overdoses has anything to do with Narcan use. So that's all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. That was a really great informative presentation. I wanted to take just a few minutes to answer a few questions. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type, type in them right now in the chat box. But we did get three already that I want to address. First, someone asked, what was the name of the grant available around prescription medication? And this, David, this is for this question. I think I'll um, turn it over to David to answer. OK. So it is called the targeted capacity expansion grant and if you go to www.samsa.gov and you click on the grants section that is on the top of the the home page uh, you'll see it listed there great okay okay next question uh, someone posed the question what type of coupons are offered and that's in reference to Carlton's presentation he was talking about incentives and disincentives um, I I do you want to say something like that question? Yeah, I was just going to say that it's about forming partnerships with your know, local businesses and communities um, and identifying creative ways to incentivize folks to participate in, in the program. And so, you know, if you, if you can form a relationship with, with a, you know, Walmart or someone uh, that might be able to offer discounts or uh, the local theater. Uh, for example, so that so that folks can come uh, to the movies with gift cards and things of that nature. Uh, that's what that's referring to. Um, and then there was a, someone had asked, uh, "What year? What year is Amy's coalition in?" I'm assuming that's what year of the DSC program. I'm assuming that's what that question maybe. Amy, do you want, what year is your DSC? Are you on? We um, were just awarded year six. Year six. Okay. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Um, and how much was the incinerator? Um, <laughs> that's the question. Um, it was total cost, it was about $12,000. The incinerator itself cost about $7,700. We bought the smallest one we could. It only burns um, 99 cubic uh, square feet, or cubic feet, I guess, 99 pounds worth of medications, 13 cubic feet. Um, and then in order to, to comply with regulations, it has to be mobile. Otherwise, in the state of West Virginia, we have to apply for a permit and do air quality testing twice a year. So um, the $12,000 includes the incinerator. It includes the welding that had to be done, and then the generator, the diesel fuel tank, and the trailer that it sits on. It does not include the insurance and the titles and tags for the trailer because that is an in-kind from our county commission. Great. Thank you, Amy. Let's see, much, a question posed is, much is stated toward youth, yet here in, in um, New York, I work with adults that are abusing 
either uh, both RX um, that are abusing their their prescription medicines of a, either their own or from a family member or paying for the street version. Adults also attend Skittles parties. Do you have stat treatment outcomes for this group? And and the question, uh, the quick answer is we have access to that information. I don't have that information here and cannot quote stats related to that at this point in time. But definitely we understand that this is an issue that is beyond just youth participating. As I, as I shared in uh, the earlier portion of our presentations, we understand that there are some specific groups that are, that are more predisposed to uh, being a part of this challenge than others. Youth is one, um, older adults um, um, and, and the elderly are, are others, uh, uh, women for a variety of reasons, uh, not just not not to a large degree more than men, but there but statistically, uh, women tend to be more um, at risk uh, for this uh, issue than than others. And then you know healthcare practitioners are are, are there. And I would also add that uh, I would recommend while we don't have staff specific stats we can give you right now, I would recommend you visit our online toolkit, which you can go to it by going to www.preventrxabuse.org. In addition to the toolkit, we have a number of fact sheets and stats on there that I think you'll find very useful. And then NIDA would also have some stats that I think um, would answer that question. And I probably need to throw in that SAMHSA has the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and we also have prescription drug abuse data. There you go. And then finally, someone asked, is data available to compare your community to similar communities rather than the national data? Very good question. I'm going to guess that that question is maybe coming to me. Okay. Um, I, I know here in West Virginia there are, there are communities who are similar to us as far as size, but depending on where you are at within West Virginia depends on what your issue is. So, like in our particular county, we have, we went from prescription drug abuse, we saw our heroin rush, which we are still seeing some heroin rush, rush, but we're already back to mess because for our community, it's cheaper for them. So, but yet the community next door to us that also borders Ohio is still on a heroin rush and they're still having major, major issues with prescription pills. So I think it, I don't know that you could truly compare yourself depending on what state you're in, because depending on where you're at within your state, you see different issues. And I, I believe SAMHSA also has state, um, state by state data. Yes, we do. So, um, that's, so that's another place to look. Um, the SAMHSA website is www.samhsa.gov. And on the top of the state, uh, the home page, you will see a button that says data. Mm -hmm. And picking this on a couple more, let's see, I think we have time for one more. Amy, does your DFC grant pay for the random drug testing in the schools? If not, do you know how that is funded? No, it does not. Um, our school board, they do not use the random drug testing as a punitive um, testing process. They use it as a means to allow our students to have a reason to say no, either on a weeknight or on a weekend. So our school board actually puts in $50,000 of their own money every year to do the random drug testing policy. Okay. okay. And Finally, is the RFA targeted capacity expansion grant that keeps being referred to the one that is due this Friday, May 8th? Uh, the answer is yes, and there's a real possibility that it, that that extend that date is going to be extended. Oh, okay, so visit the web, visit Samsa.gov, <laughs> <or, laughs> yeah, to see if it, that gets extended. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions we've gotten so far. I have up on the screen, you'll see a, just a few resources that I think you'll find helpful. Again, our prescription drug abuse online toolkit, um, as well as I don't know if you know that CACA has an online course on the prescription drug abuse issue, as well as other online courses, and you can find them all at http colon slash slash learning dot dot org. Um, then I also just listed a couple other resources there. Oops. 
And then um, just wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Pfizer, who helped help sponsor our prescription drug abuse prevention webinar series. And finally, I hope um, all of you will, um, if you're not already, will visit our website and will connect with us on our various social media platforms. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash CATCA. We're on Twitter at CATCA. We're on YouTube. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram at CATCA Coalition. So I hope you will join us on, our, on all of these social media platforms. And, and I can't end the webinar without giving a quick plug to our upcoming Mid-Year Training Institute, which is coming up August 2nd through the 6th. It's going to be in Indianapolis. I hope you all will join us. And you can find out more information about our Mid-Year at www.catca.org slash NYTI. Um, I know registration, we're accepting registration now, so I hope you guys will all take a moment to register and join us in Indianapolis. That is it. Yes. And we will have several courses, in fact, probably um, whole a whole courses. yes, a whole suite of courses on prescription drug abuse, on medicine abuse in general. So, so please join us in Indianapolis. And that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you so much to our presenters, to David, to Carlton, and to Amy. I uh, appreciate you guys being with us. Thank you. And if for those of you, many of you asked this question, but we will have a recording of this webinar as well as the slides available and we will email those out to everyone who is registered. Thanks so much. <laughs>